So we're talking about prayer. We're talking about stepping into a deeper relationship with God and going deeper in communication with God, going deeper in faith, in, in, in the things of God. Now, if you want to speak to God, you probably need to be in some place where you know He's hearing you and where you are hearing Him. All right? Sometimes people feel when they pray, or if they pray, people feel their prayers are hitting the ceiling. Or they feel, feel God is so far, you see, okay? So people feel there's no connection. Have you ever prayed and not felt connection? Okay? So sometimes we pray with the wrong perspective and with ineffective attitudes. We, we pray kind of just trying to get something from God, some response from God who feels so far away and so foreign. If you pray with the perspective that God is far away on planet heaven somewhere, because remember he got on his cloud and brrr, there he went. Now he's far away. Planet heaven beyond Jupiter and Pluto, you know. Maybe you can see him with the Hubble Space Telescope still on, his, on the way, still with his cloud. Your voice, if you are thinking natural realm, natural universe, which means three dimensions, which means touch, feel, see, five senses realm. He's far away, I'm speaking here. Your voice is heard on earth. But there's a place you can enter into where you can step into the very presence of God. So Moses wrote about that place. And in Exodus, if you, if you read Exodus chapter 33 and chapter 34, Moses spoke to God face to face like a man speaks to his friend. And in those meetings with God, Moses got the vision for the tabernacle and for the Ark of the Covenant. He saw things there that he had to make exactly according to the pattern of what he saw there as a parable because that was the thing God wanted people to visualize so that after the price was paid, after Jesus opened the way and the real sanctuary was thrown open through the cross, they could step in there, but they had to prophetically see the parable before the time so that they could see where they were headed. So Psalm 91 Those who dwell in the secret place of the Most High yes. shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. Yes. Those who dwell. Yes. Those who dwell in the secret place. Where's the secret place? Far. No, the secret place is in the Spirit. It's a spiritual place. It's not a five senses place. It's a spiritual place, and that place needs to be discerned by the Spirit to those who possess the Holy Spirit. We'll get to 1 Corinthians 2 a bit later. So for you to pray and see results, the first thing you need to get is the place. So the time and the place. If you do time and place like 2024 Valeria without the perspective of spirit, 
then your voice is heard only in Valeria. Yeah. Your voice is only heard in a building. Yes. But the moment you step into spirit, yes. the moment you step into the true heavenly sanctuary that was opened for us through his broken body and, and by the power of his blood, then you gain access into a different realm that works with different rules. So that place is outside of time and outside of space. So what is the time in which it happens? Well, eternally now. It's eternal times, from everlasting to everlasting. Where's the place? It's a spiritual place. So it's a spiritual time, and it's a spiritual place. Which means you can access the same time and the same place in the spirit from any time and any place in history and on the, on the face of the earth. And if you're an astronaut, it will even work from space. Okay? If you're watching on the internet there from the International Space Station, welcome to the service, bless you. Send us an email, we'd like to hear from you. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm sure they have internet there. Okay. So, before we go to Luke 11, let's just sort this out. Let's go to Zechariah. Let's go to Zechariah, chapter 3. Then the guiding angel showed me Joshua, the high priest, standing before the angel of the Lord, and Satan standing at Joshua's right hand to be his adversary and to accuse him. Now we know that the name Satan for the devil and for the serpent, the dragon, the name Satan is a Hebrew word that means accuser. Yeah. Adversary or accuser. Verse 2, and the Lord said to Satan, the Lord rebuke you, O Satan. So when Satan accused Joshua, who got rebuked? Satan. Yeah. Did God rebuke Joshua? No, he wanted to save Joshua. Did he rebuke Satan who accused? Was the accusation accurate? I'm sure Satan, he takes careful note of everything you do wrong. <laughs> so it's true in this sense that it is accurate. He will, you know, he will find anything you did wrong to try to blab it out to, to accuse you before God. Even the Lord who is now who now habitually chooses Jerusalem rebuke you. Is not this returned captive Joshua a brand plucked out of the fire? So he's saved out of destruction, out of the fire. Now Joshua was clothed with filthy garments and was standing before the angel of the Lord. So there, he, he, there was reason to accuse. And he spoke to those who stood before him saying, Take away the filthy garments from him. And he said to Joshua, Behold, I have caused your iniquity to pass from you, and I will clothe you with rich apparel. Okay, so this is just like that prophetically that God is saying to the church. I have caused your iniquity to pass from you, and I will clothe you in rich apparel. God wants to strip off the old garment and give you a new garment. God wants to strip off the Adamic life and give you the Christ life. God wants to strip off all sin and iniquity, all guilt and condemnation from your life and give you peace and, and grace and forgiveness and give you the fullness of His Spirit. He wants to clothe you in His Spirit. God doesn't want you to walk around in stinky, stinky garments full of remembrance of all the rubbish that you've been doing. He wants to remove those things from all remembrance, even his own remembrance. And to make sure that he didn't want to remember your sins. Remember J Jeremiah chapter 31, verse 31 to 33. He's quoted in Hebrews chapter 8. He quoted in Hebrews chapter 10 saying, I will make a new covenant after those days, says the Lord. And according to this, I uh, will uh, uh, forgive their iniquity and their sins and iniquities. I will remember no more. I will write my laws on their hearts and on their minds and their sins and iniquities I'll remember no more yes. then he goes on in Hebrews chapter 10 and where there's absolute forgiveness removal of sin and iniquity there is no longer any offering made to atone for sin so you don't go and try to make an offering for any sin that you have committed you just go to the cross yes. so to make sure 
the voice of the accuser is not heard in heaven. God cast him out. John chapter 12. Verse 31. Now is the judgment of this world. Okay. Now listen. Now the ruler, the evil genius, the prince of this world shall be cast out. Jesus said this just before he went to the cross. And I, if I, and when I'm lifted up on the cross, I will draw and, all, and attract all men unto myself. But the original says, you can check it out in the King James, he says, and I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all, men is in italics, it's not in your original language, will draw all unto me. All what? He just spoke of the judgment. Now it's the judgment of this world. And if I be lifted up, I will draw all unto me. All the judgment unto me. So what is cast out? The accuser. What is cast out? The one who tried to, who were in heaven, trying to accuse the sons of God when they presented themselves. You can go to Job chapter 1, and the sons of God were said to present themselves before God, and Satan came in among them like a creepy crawly. Where did you come from? Going to and forth on the face of the earth. Okay? So he came to accuse because he's the accuser. In Genesis, there was the serpent in the garden. There's the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and there's the tree of life. And from the beginning, he was there so that man can rule over him. The serpent was in the tree of knowledge of good and evil. What does the tree of knowledge of good and evil do? It gives you what? The knowledge between good and evil, it gives you the knowledge of sin. Sin entered into the world and death through sin. Okay? So what is the, the tree of life? It gives you the knowledge of God. So the, the one tree speaks of you and the other tree speaks of him. The one tree says, this is right, this is wrong. If you do wrong, this is sin. The other tree tells you about who, how good God is, how wonderful God is. The one accuses you, and the other one gives you life. Yes. Okay, so God is expressly commanded Adam and Eve, well, before he even made them, let them have complete authority. But he said, subdue him, rule over him. Yeah. And then the first chance he got, he submitted himself to the will of the devil. What, how did that happen? He took his thoughts. He took his knowledge into his mind. Yeah. Okay, so here's Aaron in Zechariah chapter 3. And he says, now God is rebuking Satan. He says, remove the filthy garments. Yeah. Give him a new turban, give him new garments. He says, I'm removing your, your iniquity from you. I've caused your iniquity to pass from you, and I will clothe you with rich apparel. Put a clean turban on his head, so they put a clean turban on his head, so that represents his thoughts, and clothe him with rich garments. So remember Isaiah uh, 64 verse 6 and Isaiah 61 verse 10. Isaiah 64 verse 6, uh, it's like your, you know, our righteousness are as filthy rags. So the best thing you, you could ever do in your life out of yourself is like a stinky rag. But he gives you the robe of righteousness. Isaiah 61 verse 10. So he removes your righteousness and he gives you his righteousness. He removes your thoughts and he gives you his thoughts. Isaiah 55. Let the wicked forsake his ways and the unrighteous his thoughts and let him return to the Lord for you will have love, pity and mercy for him and to our God for you will multiply to him his abundant pardon. So the moment you turn to God, he pardons you. He gives you his thoughts. He fills you with his spirit. He removes the accusation of and the iniquity altogether and he gives you himself. He is your righteousness. He is the one that will live holy and right in you, through you. Yeah. Now listen again, Zechariah chapter 3. I'm getting carried away. This was supposed to be a two-minute point. Okay. So he says, If you, 
Verse 7, will walk in my ways and keep my charge, then also you shall rule my house. Okay, those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness, or the overflowing grace and the free gift of righteousness, shall reign as kings in life. Romans chapter 5 verse 17. Now he says, you will rule my house and have charge of my courts, and I will give you access to my presence and places to walk among these who stand here. Oh, he gives you access to that sanctuary. You now have access to the sanctuary, but the serpent, the devil, the accuser is cast out of the sanctuary. We need to get this. When you pray, the accusing voice will try to come, but when you enter into that secret place of God, the accuser's voice is not to be found there. God will not remember your sins and iniquities anymore because there's no one to remind him. The only way you can enter into the sanctuary is by the power of the blood of Jesus through the separating curtain of his flesh. Hebrews chapter 10 verse 19 and 20. The only way you can enter into the sanctuary is through the the broken body of Jesus on the cross. When you enter there, you've got blood on you. So that means you're clean. The moment you go in through Jesus, the good shepherd that laid down his life, he is the door. The moment you go through, you're clean. There's no trace of sin on you. There's, no, there's not even, like Daniel and his friends in the furnace, there was not even the smell of smoke on them. So there's no trace of sin on you when the blood of Jesus comes upon you. He says, your iniquity have passed from you. So, and I will give you access into my presence so that you can stand among those who stand here. So, if you want to pray and be heard, do you want answers to your prayer? Okay? If you want to pray and be heard, don't let your heart accuse you. The accuser's voice is only heard on earth. The accuser's voice is not heard in heaven. The accuser's voice is from the lower realm. His voice that sanctifies you and brings forgiveness is from heaven. Okay? God is not your accuser. Okay. John verse, oh, I'm just stuck on this point. John 5 verse 45 says, put out of your minds the thought and do not suppose that some of you, as some of you are supposing, that I will uh, condemn or accuse you before the Father. Jesus said it to the Pharisees. Don't think I will accuse you before the Father. They are the ones that he rebuked all day long. He says, don't put out of your mind the thought. Do not suppose, as some of you are supposing, that I will accuse you before the Father. There is one who accuses you. Moses, the very one on whom you have built your trust. He says, if you believed Moses, you would have come to me because he wrote about me. So if we try to go by the... The distinction between right, wrong, right, wrong, right, wrong, right, wrong, right, wrong... Right, wrong. Is the law holy? Yes. Will the law give you life? No. Because if you, if you read it and you think it talks about you, you will look at yourself. Right, wrong, right, wrong, right, wrong, right, wrong. And even if you choose right all day long, it cannot produce life. Yes. The alternative is Jesus that brings a word of salvation out of what he has done for you. Not your own works distinguishing between right and wrong, but his works sanctifying you, cleansing you, making you righteous, making you holy, giving you access to his presence. If you want to be heard in heaven, you've got to believe that your sins are forgiven. Otherwise, your voice will be heard in this realm, but not in that one. So, 
You, you need to enter in through the blood of Jesus Christ. So Romans chapter 3 verse 20 says the following. For no person will be justified in his sight by observing the works prescribed by the law. Okay, just let that sink in. How much have you tried? How much have you tried and tried and tried and tried and tried and tried? How much have you tried to be better and better and better? The only way is by the blood of Jesus. Okay, no person will be justified by his works. For the real function of the law is to make men recognize and be conscious of sin. Not mere perception, but acquaintance with sin, which works towards repentance and faith and holy character. So, listen, there is a place for repentance, okay? But the law itself does not give you that power. The Spirit gives you that power. So verse 20 in the King James says, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. Okay. If you're going to read the law, what's going to happen? Your mind, the canvas of your mind, the place, that's like your interface. That's where you see and hear from the unseen. Your thoughts, your imagination. Listen, if you have a vision from God, where is it? Where do you see it? In your mind, okay? If you go, if you speak to God in the spirit, where is that spirit? It's inside you. You believed the gospel, the gospel came inside you. You repented. That's the changing of your mind. Yes. So now what happens? There's a different belief system in operation on the inside of you. Yeah. No longer right, wrong, right, wrong, right, wrong, but spirit. Now you have the Holy Spirit which becomes your new law, written on your heart. Yeah. So as the Spirit speaks, you obey. As the Spirit speaks, you obey. Okay. So, the Holy Spirit searches the things of God and reveals it to you. Okay? So, if, you're, if you want to see things of the Spirit, your mind will be full of the things of the Spirit. But if you're going to read the, the law of Moses, you're going to see yourself, you're going to be stuck in the five senses realm, and you're not going to see anything in the Spirit. All you're going to see is what you did right, what you did wrong. You're going to see yourself in the scriptures reading from Genesis to Revelation. Okay? You're seeing yourself. When you look at the cross, you can see through the cross into a different realm, into a different world, and the Spirit can show mysteries to you. The Spirit can show, bring revelations to your heart, to your mind, and you can start flowing in the gifts of God, the prophetic gifts. You can pray according to what the Spirit show you, and your voice is heard in that realm. If you pray according to the law of Moses, your voice is only heard here. Second Peter chapter 1. Simon Peter, a servant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who have been who have received and obtained equal privilege of like precious faith with ourselves in and through the righteousness of our God and Savior Jesus Christ. May grace and peace be multiplied to you and freedom from fears, etc. Be multiplied to you in the full personal knowledge of God and of our and Jesus our Lord. So grace and peace is multiplied to you when you get the knowledge of God. That means the gospel of grace brings to you the knowledge of God. Grace and peace is multiplied to, to you in the full personal knowledge. That's the correct and the accurate knowledge of God. So the Spirit can reveal who God really is through the gospel to you. 
The Spirit cannot reveal to you who God really is through the law of Moses because by the law is the knowledge of sin. You cannot go past the level of the knowledge of sin if you go by the law. If you want to receive anything from God, you've got to go by the knowledge of God. Okay. So now he says, by means of these, no, wait, he says, verse 3, for his divine power is bestowed upon us all things that are requisite to life and godliness through the full personal knowledge of him who called us by and, his, um, and to his own glory and excellence. So now his power comes to us and give us all things pertaining to life and godliness through the full personal knowledge of God. Where is knowledge stored? Okay, in a book. But what's the book for? To read it and then what? To put it where? In your mind. So you're gonna, if you read this thing and you see yourself and you see the law of Moses on every page and you see yourself and how bad you are and what you need to do to be better, you're going to get the knowledge of sin from but first page to last page. But if you see the cross of Christ, if you look for Jesus, you'll find him on every page. So what then happens? You get to know him. And when you get to know him, you have the knowledge of God. No longer the knowledge of sin, the knowledge of God. The sin thing is what the accuser works with. We don't want the knowledge of sin. People say, oh, yay, now I have the knowledge of sin, so I know what not to do. No, 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 no. Adam and Eve had the knowledge of sin because they partook of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and they brought death into the world. Sin entered into the, de- into the world and death through sin. We want life. So he cleanses our consciences from dead works and lifeless observances. He cleanses you from the knowledge of sin and he gives you the knowledge of God. Does that make sense? So your thoughts are sanctified. Your imagination is sanctified. The very interface on which you connect with God is sanctified. So when you approach God and you pray, something else starts happening. When you are full of the law and you close your eyes and pray, guess what's going to come up? The knowledge of sin. When you close your eyes and you pray to God, you pray in tongues, pray in the spirit wall, you pray with the spirit. Now you pray, and the spirit of God is stirred up. Man, you, you stir the fire that was... You put inside you by the laying on of hands, man. There you are, you're praying. Stir up the gift. She broke or so broke or what happens? Now the spirit starts giving you revelations. 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 Because the spirit is searching the deep, bottomless things of God and revealing it to you. So you just pray in the spirit. He knows all things. You don't have to know all things. You just have to know him. The knowledge of him, the knowledge of God, intimate fellowship. So now you pray. So Romans chapter 8 says, we, we do not know what prayer to offer or how to offer it worthily, but the Spirit comes to our aid with groanings too deep for utterance. So now you just start praying. Holy Spirit, I don't even know what to pray, but I want to pray. So no shiti bragazande. And suddenly he puts something in your heart to pray for. Yeah. Or suddenly he gives you some insight into something. Or suddenly he gives you a vision for your life. Or suddenly he gives you a song yeah. that will bless the world. Or suddenly there's some mystery revealed to you. Suddenly another gifting comes to you and you can start ministering, maybe laying hands on the sick or maybe prophesying or something, but something from the Spirit which was hidden before now starts to come to the forefront because you had fellowship with God. And you were not after the knowledge of sin, you were after the knowledge of God. With other words, you were not after the mind of the flesh, you were after the mind of the Spirit, the mind of Christ. So when you pray, pray the mind of Christ. How many people are stuck in a prayer life just trying to get rid of sin? Or stuck in a prayer life just trying to survive this month? 
or stuck in a prayer life trying to manipulate God to twist his arm in order to get your husband or your wife saved or to, to try and do something for so and then and most of the time we just either complain with God or we bring us uh, he, our shopping list to him Listen, Philippians chapter 4 is really clear. Bring your shopping list. You make your wants known to God. But isn't it maybe a good thing if you just first get rid of all the stuff in your heart? Come to God and say, Lord, I'm burdened with all these things. I come to you. You say in Matthew chapter 11, you, are, you labor and are heavy laden. Come unto me and I will give you rest. So you come to him and say, Lord, unburden me. So we pray to get to empty out all these things. To get, so we pray to get our mind into the sanctuary. So there's different forms of prayer, but there's different depths of prayer. So does it make sense? Okay. Am I, is there something coming through? Okay. All right. So, Luke chapter 11. So, in Luke chapter 11, earlier today, Prophet John also spoke about Luke being the doctor, and he always made mention of the prayer life of Jesus Christ. He says, he was, when, then he was praying in a certain place, speaking of Jesus, and when he stopped, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray, just as John taught his disciples. So it's obviously a good thing to teach people to pray. Verse 2, and he said to them, when you pray. Okay, I think it's Ian Barnes. I'm not sure who it was, but I remember Prophet Kubis quoting this quote. He says, except you pray, you will never learn to pray. So do you want to pray? Well, start somewhere and just spend time in prayer. Most of it is learned through doing it. Okay, so... May this just inspire you to actually connect with God and actually go for prayer. I'm trying to bring something out of the Word that will, that will help you to not be caught in a trap of accusation and condemnation, but where you can actually stand in the presence of God with a clear conscience and getting answers to your prayers. Okay. All right. So he says, teach us to pray. And he said to them, when you pray, say, Our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us daily our bread and forgive us our sins, for we ourselves also forgive everyone who is indebted to us, who has offended us and done us wrong, and bring us not into temptation, but rescue us from evil. And he said to them, which of you as a friend that will, will go to him at midnight and will say to him, friend, lend me three loaves. For a friend of mine who is in a journey has just come and I have nothing to put before him. And he uh, from within will answer, do not disturb me. The door is now closed. My children are in bed. I cannot get up and supply you with anything. I tell you, although he will not get up and supply him anything because he is his friend, yet because of his shameless persistence and insistence, he will get up and give him as much as he, as he needs. So I say to you, ask and keep on asking, and it shall be given you. Seek and keep on seeking, and you shall find. Knock and keep on knocking, and the door shall be opened to you. Okay, so he, he says more or less the same thing in Matthew chapter 6. A father art in heaven, I will be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Uh, give us as thou daily bread, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us, lead us not into temptation, deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory. Okay, so he said that, teach us to pray, and he said, that's how to pray. When you pray, pray this. If you can see the gospel of Jesus Christ in that prayer, and now connect scriptures, our Father. Okay, so it's not an only an individual thing. It's not only my Father. Yeah. It's our Father. Yeah. So that means sometimes we will pray together to our Father. Yeah. So it's individual prayer, but it's also corporate prayer. Yes. Our Father who art in heaven, where is He? Like I just took too long to explain. He's in the unseen realm of the Spirit. He's not our Father 
who art in Garsfontein. It's our Father who art in heaven. So don't seek Him in this touch, feel, see realm. Tree of knowledge is not going to take you there. It's going to take your attention to the wrong place. Tree of life, blood of Jesus, go through the door. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Spend time on thinking about His name, how His name is sanctified, how His name is holy. Lord, may my life just bring glory to your name. Hallowed be your name. Thy kingdom, that's His authority. Just think of all the kingdom parables, all the kingdom scriptures. Okay? Thy kingdom come, King James, in earth. Other translations, on earth, as it is in heaven. So, Lord, show me what is in heaven, what I have not seen and ear has not heard, and neither has it come up in the heart of man of the things that God has prepared for them that love him. Oh, Lord, I am the one that loves you. What have you prepared? Oh, Lord, show me by your spirit. What are the things that you have for me? Okay? So, just take the rabbit trails. And you can pray the Our Father prayer, and before you know it, a lot of time is passed. Okay? Give us this day our daily bread. I mean, he is the bread of heaven, John chapter 6. He is, you know, imagine now just thinking of all the miracles of how Jesus multiplied the bread. Okay? But he also is the bread. He's the living bread. Think of the word. The word became flesh. He is the bread. Okay? But also, he is your provision for all the stuff that you need. I mean, a lot of people like to spend time on give us this day our daily bread. So, Lord, give me this day my daily Ferrari or, you know, that kind of, a lot of people go there, you know. That's part of it, but it's not all of it. Okay. And then, and forgive us our trespasses. Oh, wow, do we got, get stuck there? But God wants you to em- empty out your heart of all condemnation. Yeah. As the accuser was cast out of heaven, the accuser must be cast out of the garden of your heart. Yeah. Remember how God said to Adam, just cast him out. Yeah. So, Jesus came to finish what Adam didn't do. He cast him out of heaven. So now his voice is not heard in heaven anymore. Now in your heart, in your conscience, when that voice starts to come, you've got to rule over the serpent. You've got to rule over the garden that is your mind. Let your garden be full of the tree of life. Let your heart, which is a sanctuary, Be not full of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, full of the voice of the serpent accusing you all day long before God. With other words, meditate on the blood. Meditate. It says, 1 John 1, if we dwell in the light as he is in the light, the blood of Jesus cleanses us and keeps us cleansed from sin, from the knowledge of sin in all its forms and manifestations. So how do we get rid of forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us? How do we get rid of that accusation and that feeling of guilt? Oh, your blood, Jesus. I dwell in your light. You are the light. The word was life and the life was the light of men. Oh, Lord, I'm dwelling in this light as I'm dwelling in your word. I'm meditating on your word. Let your blood wash me and cleanse me and keep me cleansed from sin in all its forms and manifestations. So you put your trust in what he has done on the cross. The truth is not an accurate record of your sin. The truth is Jesus Christ. An accurate record of your sin will judge you. That's the letter. And the letter will kill you. Okay. So... uh, Forgive as we forgive. It's important also to forgive. It empties out all the grudges that you hold. Purify, sanctify your heart, your conscience. Don't hold a grudge. Get it out. I want to hear God. I want to see the unseen things. I want my voice to be heard in heaven. Because the moment you start hitting people with the law, it's like you just 
slip out of that sanctuary realm and you're stuck again. In your own thoughts, you just, when Moses is read, a veil lies on their hearts and minds. But when a person turns in repentance to the Lord, that's 2 Corinthians 3 verse 15 and 16, the veil is stripped off and taken away. So what happens if the veil is stripped off and taken away? You see the Lord. You see the cross. You see the sanctuary. You see the things of God. Listen, forgive people. As soon as an offense comes, remember, as you were forgiven, so also forgive. That's Colossians chapter 3, I think. Either verse 14 or 16. Uh, Christ has forgiven you. Forgive them. Okay? Don't walk holding grudges. Okay? It causes you not to stand in that presence as you should. Okay? Lead us not into temptation. He will never lead you into temptation. Holy Spirit, lead me. Oh man, Romans chapter 8 verse 14, those who are led by the Spirit are sons of God. I want to be a son of God. I want to be born of the Spirit. I want to speak the word of the Lord. I want to, you know, so be led by the Spirit. When He leads you, follow Him. Be obedient. Okay? So you can spend time with that with that prayer, like Prophet John said earlier today, it's like, it's like a, a structure for prayer. And you can fill in scriptures. I mean, every day you can put in other scriptures and you will take, take you into other areas. Okay, so now your heart is empty, emptied out of the day. So now you can meditate. So 1 Corinthians chapter 2. So Romans 8, the Spirit comes to our aid, brokoshi brakasa, with, you know, praying in tongues, Jude verse 20, build yourselves up in your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit. So you pray, brakashiti, you're built up, man, you're taking, you rise like an edifice, you're being taken up. You find yourself in God's presence. Now, I just want to skip through, how long is Huh? Okay. Okay. Just listen. First Corinthians 2. Here he starts. I resolve to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. What's the alternative? To know among you everything that you've done right and wrong and what other people have done right and wrong. I want the knowledge of God, not the knowledge of sin. I was passed into a state of weakness and fear, great, great trembling after I'd come among you. And my language, my message, were not set forth with persuasive, enticing words of wisdom, but they were in the demonstration of the Holy Spirit and power. My words were in the demonstration of the Holy Spirit and power. Stirring in the minds of my ears most holy emotions and thus persuading me. So there's power in the words. As the words go out, Spoken through fellowship, intimate fellowship with the Holy Spirit. As the word goes out, people start to experience things that comes from the Spirit and not experience things that comes from the accuser trying to get them to feel condemned, trying to get them down and destroy them. Okay? So now your heart starts to be stirred for the things of God. Okay. Now he says... And to feel stuff is important. Listen, don't resist the feeling in, in Christ when the Spirit makes you feel things, okay? Now he says, so that your faith might not rest in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Yet when we are among f- full-grown, spiritually mature Christians, we do impart a higher wisdom. Yeah. The knowledge of the divine plan previously hidden, so now it's... Stuff that was secret that's now starting to be revealed by the Spirit to you. But it is indeed not a wisdom of this present age or of this world, nor of the leaders and rulers of this age who are being brought to nothing and are doomed to pass away, but rather what we're setting forth is a wisdom of God. So it's a knowledge of God. It's a wisdom of God, once hidden from the human understanding and now revealed to us by God. That wisdom which God advised and decreed before the ages for our glorification, to lift us into the glory of His presence. So He just said it in 1 Corinthians 1, the wisdom and the power of God is the story of Christ crucified. 
1 Corinthians 1 verse 18, okay? You can also link it with verse, verse 24. And now 1 Corinthians 2 verse 2. I want to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. That's the wisdom of God. That's the power of God. It was hidden from human understanding, now revealed to us to lift us into His glory. So He said to, to, uh, to Joshua, Hey, your sins and iniquities have passed from before you, and I will give you access to stand among these who stand by. So He's now speaking. It's like in the Spirit, that place before the throne. He says, Those who are standing there, I'll give you access to stand there. You go into, through the blood of Christ, into the secret place of the Most High. The real sanctuary of heaven that's thrown out. You can come boldly to the throne of grace. You have access. Use your access. Your access is not meant to just have it. What does it help if you just... Someone gives you his unlimited platinum card and say, you have access to everything I own. Go swipe that card, man. You have access to someone's riches, okay? Say, for, for instance, some rich guy gives you his unlimited credit card. <laughs> Use it. What does the, I mean, the card itself is worth nothing. But what it gives you access to. So what's the point of knowing, and I've said this before, I think last week, Sunday, What's the point of knowing that you can be transformed into his very own image, 2 Corinthians series 18, when you behold him in the word which is in a glass? You're transformed into his very own image from glory to glory. What's the point of knowing that if you don't behold? What's the point of having the access if you never enter? Listen. Prayer is not reciting something. Prayer is stepping into the heavenly sanctuary. While you are on earth. Thy kingdom come, Lord. Thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Let me see what's in heaven. Jesus said, I only do what I see my Father do. I only speak as I hear from Him. So that means we need to hear Him. That means we need to see So prayer is an exchange. Now you get insight from a different, from a higher realm. Prophet John uh, earlier today mentioned it, Colossians chapter 3 verse 1. Since you have now been raised to a new life with Christ, aim at and seek the rich eternal treasures that are above where Christ is seated. So the above life, that's in the sanctuary. That's where the throne is. That's where you need to set your mind. And keep it set on the things that are above, not on the things that are on the earth. Do you want your prayers to be heard in heaven? Then you've got to understand that you're forgiven. You've got to understand and believe it, that there's no accusing voice. But that in itself is worthless if you never go in and have fellowship, the knowledge of God. Get your mind sanctified. Get the trash out of your mind. He gave us the Lord's Prayer as a structure to pray. It handles everything that needs to be handled. Get the stuff out of your system so that you can meditate. We need to enter into meditation of prayer. I'm not talking, you know, Buddhism and Shintoism and Weird guys in hermits in caves. I'm not talking that. Because they want to empty themselves out. We want to be filled up with Him. Yes, I want to be empty of me, but I want to be full of Him. I want His thoughts. I want to pray according to His mind, His his thoughts. 1 John 3 verse 18. Little children, yeah, little children, let us love not merely in theory or in speech, but indeed in in truth. By this we shall come to know that we are of the truth. Yeah. By what? By love. Yes. I love what Pastor John or Prophet John said this morning. Love, prayer is love in action. Yeah. Okay. So he says, by this we shall come to know 
that we are of the truth and can reassure our hearts where? In His presence. Whenever our hearts in tormenting self-accusation make us feel guilty and condemn us. Listen. The enemy has no access there. He's not speaking in heaven. But your own heart will condemn you. So where does that come from? Well, God spoke in Genesis 3 to Adam. He's like, did, did you not eat of the tree that I told you not to eat from? <laughs> it's like, really? that You had one job, really? So, if you're going to welcome accusation in your heart, when you pray, it comes like, mm-hmm. yeah. Yep, 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 yep. <laughs> okay, so whenever your heart accuses you, you can reassure your heart. What reassures your heart? Love. When we show love. So if I intentionally show love to people, it reassures my heart. When I live by the Spirit, it reassures my heart when accusation comes in His presence. Then He says, For God is greater than our hearts. We are in God's hands. For He is above and greater than our consciences and He knows all things. Everything, He knows everything. Nothing is hidden from Him. So, if your heart accuses you, where was the love of God shown where we are concerned? First John chapter 4, just the next chapter, in that He sent His Son to be there. Sacrifice for our sins. Amen. The love of God cleanses your conscience. The blood of Jesus cleanses your conscience from dead works and lifeless observances. So when the accusation comes, you take the word and you think on it. Meditation is thinking into a certain direction until you get connection. That's meditation. Meditation. Thinking into a specific thing until you get connection. So you take the word and you think. And you think on it. What will help you think? You say it. You speak it. Like Prophet John said also this this morning, the, the Hebrew word for meditation is mumbling. Joshua chapter 1. Joshua, do not uh, let this book depart from your mouth. Meditate on it day and night. How do you meditate on it? You don't let it depart from your mouth. Whatever you are speaking, your mind is following. When you speak something, your mind just believes it. So confess the word, speak the word. Get your heart and your mind full of the word. So when the accuser comes, speak aloud. The blood of Jesus cleanses me and keeps me cleansed from sin in all his forms and manifestations. I'm dwelling in the light. Jesus Christ died for me. Imagine something. John chapter 8, the woman caught in the act of adultery. Here she comes, thrown before Jesus, and the Pharisee stands there defiantly, saying, Moses says, stoner, what do you say? And this they said to try and trick him because they wanted to kill him. And he just writes on the soil. I have one translation that says he started writing names and places on the soil. I don't know what he wrote. Most translations don't say it. And he stood up and said, let the one without sin cast the first stone. Again, rebuke the accuser and defended the sinner. Because salvation was on his heart for her. Okay. 
So, then he wrote again on the sand, and they all conscience stricken went their way. So if you're going to come with the law to accuse people before God, you're going to have egg on your face. Okay? When they all left, no one accusing her. Who are, where are your accusers? No one here, Lord. Neither do I condemn you. Now. Now that there's no condemnation, no accusation, no accusing voice, it's now all gone. Now you're in my presence, right before me, among these who stand by. Now you have obtained grace. Now I say unto you, go and sin no more. And now there's power in the words because it's spoken from the sanctuary. It's spoken from the very presence of God. There needs to be connection. The thing that breaks the connection is when we meditate on what we've done right or wrong when we think law when we think right wrong come to God yeah I did this this is don't worry you're forgiven he says oh I did this wow God says forgiveness is paid for at the cross don't worry I forgive you for the best thing you've ever done I forgive you freely So whether, whether we stand before God just having done the worst thing of just having done the best thing, if you come with your own works according to the knowledge of good and evil, God says, you're forgiven. Let's just get it out of the way. Yeah. Let me show you what I have done for you. Yeah. Okay? The mind of Christ. I'm totally sidetracked. Get to back to First Corinthians chapter 2. Almost done. I need to land this plane. I'm going to skip a few things. On the contrary, as the scripture says, what eye has not seen, ear has not heard, neither has it come up into the heart of man. All that God has prepared, made, keeps ready for those who love him. If you love God, there's stuff that He's prepared that He wants to reveal to you. If you step into that place, He will reveal it to you. Yet to us, God has unveiled and revealed them by and through His Spirit. The place that we need to step into is in the Spirit. For the Holy Spirit searches diligently, exploring, examining everything, even sounding and profounding uh, the profound and bottomless things of God. For what person perceives and knows what passes through a man's thoughts except the man's own spirit within him? Thoughts, mind. Your spirit knows the thoughts in you. Okay? No one knows your thoughts inside you except your own spirit. Just so no one discerns the thoughts of God except the spirit of God. This is so important. Now we have not received the spirit that belongs to the world, but the Holy Spirit who is from God, given to us that we might realize and comprehend and appreciate the gifts of divine favor so lavishly bestowed on us. And we are setting these two forth in words not taught by the human wisdom, but taught by the Holy Spirit, combining and interpreting spiritual truth to spiritual language. But the natural, non-spiritual man does not accept, welcome, admit into his heart the gifts, teachings, and revelations of the Spirit of God. The guy that's going by right, wrong, right, wrong, right, wrong. That's only seeing what's happening in the touch, feel, see, five senses realm. That guy cannot discern the things of the Spirit. Okay? So he says, the natural man does not accept it. He's incapable of knowing them. Remember John chapter 8, Jesus speaking to the Pharisees, and he says, why are you misunderstanding me? It's because you are unable to hear what I'm saying. And you are unable to hear what I'm saying because you are of your father, the devil, because my words have no entrance in you. You do the lusts of your father. He's a liar from the beginning and a murderer. You're seeking to kill me. You are a murderer also just like him. Okay? So... Isn't it interesting that legalistic people would very quickly resort to death as an option, uh, as a solution to a problem? 
Oh, the country has a lot of crime. Get the death penalty. Yeah, that's going to solve it. Why don't we just get revelation? Why don't we just get revival on the scene and save all the people that you want to kill? What about the souls of all the people? Okay. All right, let's just leave that one there. Okay. But the spiritual man tries all things, examines, investigates, inquires, and questions, discerns all things, yet is himself to be put on trial and judged by no one. If your heart is in the Spirit, you're praying in the Spirit, your mind is in the Spirit, you're getting ideas and solutions from the Spirit, you're praying the mind of Christ, the knowledge of God. If your mind is there, spiritual people look from the outside, they will judge you according to superficial works. But they cannot really judge you because they're not spiritual enough. Because they don't know what's going on there. It says, Yet is himself to be put on trial and judged by no one. He can read the meaning of everything, but no one can properly discern or appraise or get an insight into him. For who has known and understood the mind of the Lord so as to guide, instruct him, and give him knowledge? But we have the mind of Christ, and we do hold the thoughts, feelings, purposes of his heart. Thoughts, the feelings, the purposes of his heart. We have the mind of Christ. When people come to you with prayer requests, sometimes yeah, I do not know what to pray. Because people would pray strange things. Pray that my neighbor's dog will die. <laughs> pray that, you know, I don't know, that a tornado will suck up my neighbor's house or something. No. It's like, I see your prayer requests, but let's just see what God thinks about this. I'm, this is ridiculous examples, I know, okay. But sometimes people pray and you don't really know, is that exactly what we should pray for? You know, don't know. So sometimes, or even something like, I pray that I get this job. Well, did you ask God if you're supposed to have it? Yeah. Did you ask God, is that where you're supposed to be, or, or you're supposed to be somewhere else? Yeah. So God is not supposed to bow his knee to our prayer request. Yeah. We need to get word from him. We do not know how we should pray, what we ought to pray, or how we should offer the prayer worthily. But the Spirit comes to our aid. Romans chapter 8. So now, let's get the mind of Christ on this thing. What is the mind of Christ? Holy Spirit, I just pray your blood over this situation. I just pray your love over this situation. I just declare your love over these people. Over, Lord, just bring a solution. You know? And suddenly these thoughts and stuff that comes, comes uh, these visions and stuff coming, these solutions that come, sometimes it's so simple it's ridiculous. And it's rather a good thing to hear from God what you need to pray about certain situations than to just regurgitate some prayer requests. Yes. Get the mind of Christ on it. Yes. One day I was sitting in the gym steam room. I mean, there I've had so many conversations with so many people. <laughs> so there was this actor on South African television. I still don't know who he is. Sorry, I don't really watch TV. I have no, no idea. Nothing in my house is connected to SABC or Mnet or nothing. I have no idea who he is. So uh, I think it took him a little bit back because he's supposed to be well known, but it's like, sorry, dude, I have no idea who you are. So, <laughs> so we were sitting there, and he said, yeah, he's got this big problem. He need to make this decision. Must he take this job or this one or this contract or that? I can't really even remember. He had a choice to make. And we were just chatting and I was we talking about ministry and all kinds of things. So he said, yeah, he's got this burning thing. He doesn't know which choice to make because he, he doesn't want to make the wrong choice. So I, so I just said, do you know what? The best thing to do is just get close to Jesus. Forget the choice. Turn to him, worship him. 
Get to know him. Praise him. See him for who he is. Because now, when you, when you get to him, what happens is your heart opens up for him. You, you get into his presence. You're standing in the sanctuary. Just standing there. I mean, who says it's got to be one of those two? Okay. So I said, just get close to him. Get, receive his grace. Receive his peace. Let peace reign over your heart. And then just pick one. Just pick one. Just, but pick one under the influence of the Holy Spirit. Then it will be the right one. Or His grace will come upon it. Or He will stop you if you're making the wrong one. Okay. So I think when we pray, first thing, get into His presence. Second thing, it's good to pray, pray the Lord's Prayer Settle all the stuff. But make time for meditation. Get the word in your mind. Yeah. Meditate on the word. Speak the word. Until you have connection. Meditate on it. Meditate on it. Meditate on it. And then sometimes something come, a revelation come, and then it's like, wow, 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 wow. And then you start reading Bible because you prayed. Because you got a message. Okay? Wow, look at this. Wow, look at this. Wow, look at this. Listen. Okay? Instead of just screaming stuff towards heaven, not knowing, you know. So, it's like you pray like a shotgun and you hope one of the little bullets <laughs> hits something. <laughs> Okay, Lord Jesus, let us pray accurately. Let us pray with the mind of Christ. Let us pray with connection. Let us pray through the Spirit. We want to ask you, Holy Spirit, come into us, pray through us. Reveal to us what we ought to pray and how to pray. We pray, show the deep, unsearchable things of God. We just pray, Lord, take us into a deeper place of fellowship. Take us into a deeper place of meditation in the Word. Take us into a deeper place of revelation. Let us know your heart. Let us know your mind so that every word is God-breathed. Let every word be God-breathed when we pray in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. I just pray from this time forward. Lord, I just pray. Let prayer become the focus of our lives. Let prayer, fellowship with you, relationship with you. Just take us into a whole new life, into a whole new dimension. Prayer together, prayer on our own. Let prayer be the, the first solution. Let it be the most powerful weapon we have. We just pray, Lord Jesus, give us revelation on prayer. And as we go home, as we move about, as we go on to our lives after this conference, I just pray, continuously teach us to pray by your Spirit. Teach us in every moment what to pray, how to pray. it. Holy Spirit, come and pray in and through us. Reveal what you want us to pray for and how to do it. In Jesus' name. Let us move and pray by your Spirit in Jesus' name. Amen.